Welcome to Dream Loudly, and I'm Possible Original Show. Once again, we are your hosts, Michael Lancaster and Bryce Stanhope. And I just want to be—I rem- just want to remind you before we start that the Dream Loudly Foundation is now live. We're not yet accepting applications for scholarships, but if you're wanting to donate to help trainers be able to learn and have resources in the game of basketball, to help players have scholarships that they otherwise wouldn't be able to get, so they can actually access training. Dream Loudly Foundation is there for that purpose. So head over to dreamloudlynow.com and you can check that out. And scholarships, of course, for players will be coming soon as we launch the nonprofit um, in this type of way. Now, as we get into this first show, Bryce has something um, planned today that I do not know. So I will turn it over to Bryce and he will kick this off. So I, I thought it would be fun to ask Micah some really blank statements that I see even through other podcasts and just things that are people are saying on social media with basketball and just, you know, a lot of people giving their opinions. And I, I just want to see what Micah's response to some of these statements would be. So now the very first statement would be basketball is an easy game. Oh, can I say basketball is a simple game? It's a simple game. Kind of those same concepts. Everybody loves to say that right now. Basketball is an easy game. It's a simple game. Don't complicate it. Yeah, that's one of the most common things that people say is, you know, they use the, the phrase kiss, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Everything is, is basketball is simple, and so don't overcomplicate it, basically is the message. And to that, to me, is just a very ignorant statement because it's only talking about the concept of basketball. So there are truths to it when it comes to the situational aspect of the game. If the basket is available for me and I have an easy line of the basket, keeping it simple would be do a one dribble drive. Yep. So people, you know, the, I just I picture Rasheed Wallace, his rant on yep. ESPN recently when he's just talking about simple. And to an extent, he's correct. Take what the defense gives you. Don't overcomplicate it. You're also 6'10". Which also goes into it. <laughs> But he, he started off okay, and then he got into you would have to be able to get to the basket in one dribble, and you got to get down the floor in four. So those were like all like the, yeah. the types of things we were always told. But it gets so much more than that. Mm-hmm. So that is the simple side of it. But we have to be able to take it to different levels if you ever want to be special, if you're not six foot ten with a seven foot three wingspan. <laughs> and so Keep it simple is for the situational aspect of the game and the obvious parts of the game. But you can't ever tell me that the details of technique and the abilities of the basketball are simple. Absolutely. And so I always use uh, our Kyrie port as an example of that as of late, where we'd studied 10 straight games of Kyrie, and he used over 170 skills in those 10 games. If basketball was a simple game, I would have just said something like Kyrie used 10 skills in 10 games. Yeah. But he used 170 of them, which means if there's 170 possible skills that even can be done and identified, then he had to perform 170 different techniques in a span of 10 games. And when we went over that report, we also noticed there's things we've seen him do that wasn't in those 10 games. So that means that those those skills can go even further with him, 200 plus skills. So any game that can have 200 plus skills is not a simple game. It's yep. a game full of detail, it's a game full of technique, and it's up to players to really dig into that. Yep. So my second question that popped up the other day on, on someone's podcast is, positionless basketball has ruined the game. <laughs> has ruined. Can, you, can I get context? Can I get how it has ruined? Do we get any of that? They just, they just said from the very, very beginning of the way basketball was meant to be played, it has gone so far off the track from that that now because we don't have bigs and we have kids playing positionless positions, there's no more bigs on kids' teams, that it has ruined the game. Um, it kind of reminds me of where people are, are like basketball purists yeah. and they say things like, don't disrespect the game. This game is not a human being to be disrespected. Yeah. So I understand from the aspect of you know, sportsmanship and things like that. But there is no way this game is supposed to be played. This game will constantly be changing, constantly be evolving, and so there is no right way to play basketball. Because that's the other thing that people will say. They just don't play the game the right way. What is that? Is it the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s? What is the right way? So we have to evolve with that. There's no humanness to the game that can be disrespected in that way. But to me, that just comes down to, when I picture that, I think of coaches who want to control 
And so they have a certain way that they coach the game of basketball. They want less dribbles, passing a certain amount yep. of times, moving the ball. I recently saw someone on social media basically saying that, you know, basketball's best when players are basically not dribbling at all, yep. passing, moving the ball around and finding open shots. And that would be a game that glorifies a coach. Mm -hmm. That's what happens, I think, a lot of times in the women's game is coaches want their work to have the wins, yeah. not the player's work to lead to wins. And so positionless basketball is now a game where it's all skill. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I love that game. Yeah, it's fun to watch. I, I want to see people put the ball on the floor. I want to see footwork. I want to see skills, freedom of movement, and flow. And so I hope the game stays in that realm. Yeah. But as far as positionless being the reason, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Let's continue to allow all players to play the game with footwork, with skill, with shooting, with finishing, and everything. And then over time, I think that we're going to be able to see it come back to a position game with all skill. Yeah. Where we go back to back to the basket, but those same players can still do everything else. They can still put it on the floor. That's what I was going to say. Do you think there, there will ever be another time where we'll see another Shaq-type player that wants to be back to the basket and just dominate out of his size? Yeah, I mean, I could see Embiid being... And he's not. I'm not saying he's Shaq. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's not go there. But Embiid has that body. He's yep. not quite the same bulk, but he's plenty big. Yeah. And he has a bunch of skill. He just doesn't have that aggressiveness, that dominating factor in the yeah. paint that Shaq to had. To just put you on the hip and back you down. But he could have. Yeah. Like, he's a guy that, you know, maybe it could be back issues and things he had early on, but he could be a guy that could have been that dominant Shaq, but also can get out to the perimeter and shoot the basketball yeah. and put it on the floor. So that tells me that there will be. Yeah. But I, I think that's where the game is going to go is everyone, regardless of how freakishly big you are, can become skilled, can put the ball on the floor, can shoot the basketball, and then that's when the game, I think, will just reach a whole different level. Yeah, absolutely. So th this was one that I saw on just somebody's social media post, and they asked a trainer who, who has a pretty big following – what is the most important part of being trainer, a trainer? And his response was, social media is the most important part of being a trainer. Social media is. That was number one. Number one <laughs> on his list. They were like, when it comes to being a trainer, what is the most important part? Was there any context to that at all? Nope. He listed off about three things. He said um, social media and then keeping the game simple and then there was like one more thing on there as a trainer. Social so, media took the number one spot. <laughs> so it sounds like he's putting the business above everything else. Yep. Um, the, the hard thing about putting social media number one is number one, you're making it all about you. And that doesn't do a good job of building players up. Mm -hmm. So I think social media from a business standpoint of building a long lasting business, not short term gains, is always got to remain to be about your players and about what you're doing, about the craft. Um, and helping people actually reach their dreams and being successful. Posting, that's fine. And that will create organic business because you're doing right by people. You're helping people. When you make it all about you, if you say that social media is the main thing about being a trainer, to me, and I don't know who you're referring to, but they're probably building more of an influence, more of fans, and they're not building a real business. Yeah. They're not building clients. They're not building people who are training with them. And, I, and to me, that's where a lot of the social media training has gone, is I get scared for those trainers from a long-term perspective. Yeah. I've been doing this for 15 years, and we've built a legitimate business mm -hmm. of return people, people who travel to us every single year, people who've been, been members for years on our systems, because we're doing right by them. Yeah. If you're only trying to get fans and followers, those aren't customers. Those aren't people who are necessarily going to be taking advantage of your training. They're just fans. They're people who are watching you for skits, yeah. who are watching you for entertainment. And so I hope that you can eventually make some real income off of your, your following and yeah. your fans, but that's a whole different model. So to me, the most important thing for a trainer would be, number one, do you have knowledge and are you good? I'm uh, glad you said that. That's got to be the number one. I was hoping that's where we were going to Can agree. we please just be good first and foremost? Yep. Do you have knowledge? Can you share with people? And so once you have that, then it is, do you have understanding of business? Yep. So how those two things aren't in the first part of it 
is, is where probably everything is wrong with social media. Because a lot of trainers are good, and then they don't know what they're doing with business. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. And if you have good understanding of business, but you're not good, then you're not going to have anything long-lasting anyway. Yeah. So we could get into more details. I'm keeping it broad. But you need to understand how business actually works after you're actually good at what you do. Yep, absolutely. And I, I think, obviously, that's the trend we're in right now. Whereas, I mean, we're in the social media era, era, but social media is changing quick. You know, one of the biggest apps was Vine, disappeared. And then TikTok comes out. Now, supposedly, that's going to disappear. So there's always going to be another app that comes out, another social media platform that keeps rolling. Um, so that, that's what I think about with those two is, you know, and it's not to offend anybody. I mean, the social media skits, the basketball skits, they get views, they get followers. But in the long run, what is it really going to do with you? Like, what's the plan at that point? And I think that's one of the things with these types of statements of social media as a trainer, because it is very important. Obviously, it helps yeah. us. We put time into social media, but most of it's because once players come train with us and they see that they're getting better, and they see that there's a longevity in their career, that the social media is just kind of an organic part of what we actually do, and it just revolves everything. Yeah, and, and like I said, not, not to bash anybody on this, but the amount of trainers doing skits now, yeah. it, it just has me questioning, like you just said, where are we going? Yeah. Who are you? Are you a trainer? Yeah. Or do you actually help? basketball players are you a social media influencer yeah. yeah so so i think that in some ways you have to make up your mind are you an influencer which i got no problem with if you want to be an influencer be an influencer absolutely but i think what's weird is when you have someone who's basically an influencer you're gaining following through skits and acting things out mm -hmm. playing both sides talking mm -hmm. to yourself and obviously putting on these these presentations that have nothing to do with getting people better you're just building like we talked about fans and followers yeah. who just want to be entertained but those aren't people who are necessarily going to go to you for basketball. Yeah. And what are you bringing to the basketball world? So hopefully there's an end game there that maybe if you can yeah. get all these followers, then you can you know stop doing skits someday and go back to actually teaching basketball. But that's yeah. my issue with it is, is I got no problem with what you're doing. But those people shouldn't yet be looked at by trainers and players as someone who is an authority in the game of basketball. The yeah. So go yeah. to them. Get, get your entertainment. But the problem is because someone gains following, mm -hmm. if someone doesn't know, they just assume, oh, that must be one of the, the basketball the yeah. you know, yep. leaders in the industry. And they just haven't really have any substance to them outside of just how they gain followers. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, this is one I like because I, I hear a lot of, a lot of older, older basketball people say this one. Um, this is more of a statement that I hear outside of social media, but I see it there too. But you only need two moves as a player – to be effective. Are you 6'10 with a 7'3 wingspan? That's where that always come, <laughs> comes back to. Um, I, I just remember um, back when I was working out with Oladipo, one of his guys was around, and he was very, very adamant on, Chris Paul's only got two moves. And I think sometimes the problem with this one is, what are you classifying as a move? Yeah. And I think people struggle with that is like, what is a move? To them, it might appear to be just one move, but yeah. they don't notice there's different footworks, different yeah. techniques that are happening. So you, it's sort of like we always talk about with a step back, where TV announcers will call anything going away from the basket is a step, step back. back. Yeah. And so they'll call, hey, Luca's got a great step back move. Well, if you watch Luca do his step back, he does it in a variety yeah, a of, of ways. ways. Yeah. So if we really wanted to get picky with it, Though that could be 10 to 20 different ways he gets into a step back. Yeah. And so that is, is technically, if you were to learn those as moves, would take you a long time to develop all of those. Yeah. Um, I think that it kind of goes back to the same thing of you only need two moves to be effective is going back to keeping it simple. Yeah. Um, You have people who approach basketball like there's thousands of skills possible. That there's this, the game of basketball is almost this completely unpredictable thing. And so you want to be able to just train random and, and do a, every rep different because there's no predictability to it anyway. But the game of basketball is actually pretty predictable. And I think what people, why they say it's simple is because they're confusing simple with predictable. Yeah. So if I'm going to come down and do a drop, I'm going to do a drop with the intent on doing something because I'm already reading off of how the defense has been playing me. So I might come down to the court knowing that I'm about to hit him with a drop with the purpose of driving. 
So there is that predictability and the predetermined factor that I am going to drop and drive. But I have to learn how to do that drop in such a way that I can change my mind. And that's where people miss it. If I don't work on my drop cross and my drop shot and all my drop options with that same footwork and that same body position, I'm not gonna be able to change my mind. And if I come down the floor with that predetermined drop in my head and I don't have the ability to change my mind, that's when you're gonna end up being turnover prone. Mm -hmm. But if so, if I know I'm gonna do a drop and they do exactly what I'm expecting them to do and I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna do that over and over and over again and I'll keep it simple. But the advanced nature of it is that I always have the ability to read and react when I have to. Mm -hmm. That should not be confused with being predetermined in a way where I'm gonna plan out, I'm gonna drop, then I'm gonna hit him with a spin move, and then yeah. I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do that. And so, you know, you have to have that in mind. But at least when I start, I'm going to have a predetermined factor there, I'm gonna have some predictability, and then I'm gonna get right to my spots. And so that's what we should be focusing on in this, in this concept. Now, what was the original question so I can swing back? Now, the original question. Do you only need two moves? You only need two moves as a player. Right. So. If you look at it from that way, I have my drop. Now, what we just said is you have to have all those branches yeah. off of that drop. And so that would be maybe one move. Yep. Right? There's my one move with my counters. Yeah. Yep. And that can branch off to a, very, a much more detailed, yep. in-depth understanding of it that players will have. And if you have that, then like Kobe would use that drop most of the time. MJ would use that drop most of the time. And then you can play off of that. And you can do that with, with one or two or three things and yep. be effective. Yep. So yes, that part is true, but you need to understand that there's a lot of branches out of that one so-called move Yeah. in order to make that work. A lot of times I think that's just a very broad statement when they think like of a move is like, like oh, Kobe and MJ, they have their mid-range. They think of that as a move. Yeah, the mid-range really, move. That's just like a, <laughs> a spot where like, like I, think, I think in that statement, what I like to think of it is, and I don't always know if this makes the most sense of people, is like, I don't really like to think of things as moves, but movements. Yeah. Where like a skip is technically a, a move. A, you know, drop is a, is a move. A between the legs cross is a move. But I think when people start thinking moves, they think of these signature moves. You know, you think Tim Hardaway, you think of, you know, the form of a between the legs cross. But like we've talked about in prior things is he did that move 20 different ways. So I, yeah, I think just because just he went between the legs broad. and crossed. Yeah. Doesn't mean that. That's his move. Yeah. That's move one. Yeah, so, but um, no, awesome. So, two last questions. This was aimed at young players. I think the players in this group were probably around fifth, sixth grade. Is you have to have an identity as a player. You have to have identity as a player at a young age. Yeah, at a young age. Yeah, that's to me the exact opposite of what we would teach, obviously. Yeah. Um, the player needs to find their identity, and they're gonna find that over time. Yep. The trainer's job, especially for the young players, is not to guess and assign it. what yeah. that identity is going to be. We put, and we did an episode on this a, a, a few weeks back, of basically trainers shouldn't become your oracles. We're yeah. not. And so there are some trainers who are very good when you're already a developed player. Absolutely. That can basically say, you know what, I think you're going to fit really well into this role in the NBA. And then they basically talk with the player, and that player has to come to a decision of, you're right. That's going to be my job. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're determined that, that that's it. That's fine. That's, that's healthy. Yeah. If a player doesn't want that role, and they want it, then they have to be able to keep pursuing whatever it is they want to become as a basketball player. Over time, they figure out what their identity is, and they stick to it. But that happens at the elite levels. So if you've already chosen your identity as a middle schooler, it's a whole lot harder to be successful, mm -hmm. especially if you chose your identity as just going to be sit in the corner and shoot a three and play defense because that's a hard way to be successful early on to be yeah. that good at that role that you're now going to get to college in order to do that role. Yeah. Cause if you're in high school and that's all you can do, a lot of times you, you're relying on too many factors, people yeah. getting you the ball for one, but you know, you might not have the opportunities to really shoot it. And so to be able to do more with the ball early on, yep. To be able to have success, score in the 20s, for instance, helps you get to college. Mm -hmm. Even there, you might be able to go loose a little bit and, and, and make things happen. And then yeah. when you finally get to your dream level, what we always talk about, whether or not it's international pro or NBA, now you can decide at that point to train more for that role and, and settle on an identity. Yeah. But man, we got to be so careful about trying to force identities on kids at young ages. Yeah. Like they have to figure that out now. 
Well, I think that was even even my problem as a player is I, I kind of did it to myself. Is like I always had myself pictured as a two. Kobe was my favorite player of all time. So shooting the ball, scoring the ball, not a problem. I stopped growing at six foot one. Even right. though I thought I was gonna get my brother's height at six seven, at six foot one, what position do I pretty much have to play at the next levels? I gotta be a point guard. Well, since I didn't go through and develop the handle, develop what you need as a point guard and stuff, my height limited probably where I could have gone with basketball. So now I, lo I love comparing myself to Kobe, but it was the same problem. Is like I gave myself an identity at a pretty early age, and I did those things really well. But then my height pretty much said, "You're done." So now I'm stuck playing at a two guard spot, and you know, at a smaller level college. Yeah, and, and I had the opposite. I was the little guy, and everyone tried to put an identity on me. Yeah, floaters. You know, um, here is the picture of your future: floaters and threes. And so that was the profile, the avatar that they gave me. And I was more so, nope, I see Michael, I see Isaiah, I see these players doing things I want to do. So I knew I wasn't going to be tall. I knew I was going to be small. Yeah. My dad is five foot six, five foot seven ish. Um, my grandpas were five foot three. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't I'm, in the bloodline. I'm, I'm a giant at five nine. <laughs> so I knew I wasn't going to be big. But I also trained like MJ and, tr and did those things because I wanted to be yeah, able to have those in my the, game, to yeah. be able to fade, to be able to finish with creativity and craftiness, use hang time. And without that, I, I, I wouldn't yeah. have made it anywhere. Yeah. And so because I refused to accept that identity and I had my own identity in mind that I trained towards, it allowed me to play in a much different way, become a scorer, become a playmaker yeah. at a higher level. So. I think that we need to push the boundaries for kids with their skills so they can come to the identity themselves. Yeah. And that's always going to be the healthiest. Yeah. And I, I think players and like I've always talked about this, we've seen players have that problem in the NBA where coaches try to change the identity that they have formed and the NBA doesn't work out well for them. Where I, like I don't know many players that go through working out and really get in the gym that don't eventually find their own identity of who they are. It just gets weird when a coach tries to change that. You can't, you can't change who somebody is. Maybe they can do something that you need them to do, but a person at their core is always going to be who they kind of want to be. It's hard to, it's hard to change that. You and I have always joked about this, that if we got a shot in the NBA, what would be the best path? If we got playing time, what would be our approach to make it or break it time? I'm jacking. I'm going Jeremy Lin. I'm, I'm, shooting, I'm, I'm shooting the ball because if I can have a I game – where I just happen to make shots, right? You make the first one, all right, I'm rolling now. Yep. If I can, if I can shoot 12, 13, 14 times in a game, yep. and I just happen to make a decent percentage, well, we it's just, hard we, to we just saw that this year with the kid from Brooklyn. Um, shoot, what's his name? Cam, might be Cam Thomas, but uh, played, at, played at LSU. They trade Kyrie. He goes like three 40-point games in a row. Even though the end of his season, they didn't play him a ton because he's young. Those three 40-point games pretty much guarantee him to be in the NBA at least for another four years because people are going to be like, oh, well, he did something here, so there must be something there for him to do what he did. So it allows people to keep looking at you. Right. And before we jump on away from this, one other issue, and this will be maybe something we need to talk about in another episode. The other part of the identity is the attitude part, the mental part. Yeah. And so one of the mistakes that we talk about quite a bit with players is that they get on an elite AAU team. Yeah. And they never learn how to be the guy. Yeah. Or the main person yeah, we need on to that talk, team. We need to talk about that one another and episode. And so if one. I was to direct parents on this, I don't want them to jump team to team to team. That's not what I'm saying. But if you are an elite team, find a bad team. Yep. Where you can be the main go-to, yep. so you can establish even more of that identity. It's hard to be the man if you don't know what it's ever like to be the man. Yeah, and and you can maybe get that in high school too. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, even those kids are even stacked on their high school teams. Yep. And so you need to have some situation where you can be the person that has the ball in their hands, and you can take on that alpha male yeah. role or and, just and the alpha woman role. Yeah, we we've talked about that. You might be good enough to be the alpha on just every team you're on. Then right. you're just in the jackpot. Right. Yeah. But if you're not, and, and you're a role player on a really stacked up AAU team, and you don't find a situation to have the ball in your hands on one of those weaker teams, then you, you're getting steered 
also towards that yeah, role. There's nothing you can be able to do about that it. role really bad. Man. So that's something we got to swing back to. Yeah, well. we got to talk about that on an episode. So la- last one, I'll let you wrap it up. Players train too much. They need to play more. <laughs> oh, I hate that one. It just it. If we're just being logical about the day and age we're living in, we are playing more basketball games. One hundred percent. Than we ever have in the history of basketball. So. How can you say that's what's missing? Yeah. Like when we post, you know, forget all that. Just play. What yeah. do you think these kids are doing? That's all they're they do. They're doing nothing but playing. That's all they now, do. Now, I think they're coming from the perspective of, of finding pickup games. Yeah. Playground basketball. And, and that's something I would agree with. Right. They yeah. do need that. So what I would say first and foremost is let's get rid of some of these organized games. Yep. Let's, ta- let's, let's pull back on that. We'll push that. Hashtag play more pickup. You're right. Yep. But... Pickup games just aren't around. No. Where are you finding them? I can't go out to the park right now and, and find games. And if you do play pickup, it's with your high school where there's coaches watching. And if you do something stupid in pickup, you're going to get yelled at for that too. So if you can't find quality pickup games, there's nowhere to go for that. Yeah. And so you just tell people to just just play, just play. That's the stupidest advice you could ever give them. Yeah. You're, you're telling them to go do something that they can't easily access. So now instead of that, what are they doing? Yeah. No. The answer should be train 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 and and i hate the fact that we're skipping over that kevin durant said that he trained what 85 percent of the like time 85 percent 10 percent was one-on-one and pick up and then the last like five percent was actually organized basketball kobe in the summers yeah training working we never himself. heard kobe say the phrase like hey you just need to play more like you just need right. to, we need to play more games and I think that a lot of times we use MJ as an example of playing because he was known for, you know, having his elite runs yeah. and things like that. But yeah. are we really assuming that he but did again, that? But again, that's pickup. <laughs> right. That's like pickup. It's pickup. Yeah. But are we really assuming that's what he did the majority of time of? Yeah. A guy who was known for his work ethic, he's not spending time on his own, yeah. working on his skills. And so but we say, oh, yeah, but that's just MJ. Yeah, that's just Kobe. That's just KD. Yeah. Well, if they're doing it. Like, don't you think you probably There's need to, too? There's got to be something there a little bit. They probably yeah. didn't even need anything. They yeah. still would have been fine. So, you know, it, it's our, all of our logic is, is backwards. Yeah. We need to understand that we're playing more games than we ever have in the history of basketball. And yeah. what they're doing less in the history of basketball is spending time alone by themselves. So that's what we're always trying to get yeah. back in the game yep. is be a gym rat. Yeah. Oh. Stop tearing down gym rats. People are making fun of gym rats, yeah. calling them workout warriors, and, yeah. and, and saying that's you know, not going to do anything for you. What are you talking well, about? Well, I think the key is like what, what you just said and what we've always push, pushed as an organization is working out on your own. Because I, I think that's where I get where they're looking at that broad look of like, okay, kids have a ball in their hand a lot now, but it's always in an organized manner. Like even us, we don't train players that often. We give you what you need to work on. You have to go on your own and work on it. And the kids that do do it turn into animals. Right. The kids that don't do it, they get a little bit better from training with us. Like they get, they get better in the gym. They learn to do techniques. But because they're not spending that time on their own, they're not truly training. And I think that's what a lot of people have lost is like I don't think people really understand what training even is anymore. They think because they have a ball, they're in a gym, they're training. And even training now is a lot of times becoming just another way of playing. Yeah, whereas just ones, it's it's just these. You're giving them the read. Yeah, you're giving them picks and screens. One-sided and games. You're telling them what to do. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So the the creativity of training alone and freestyling at times, understanding how to hold yourself accountable here, and and playing and working through your weaknesses, you know that's really really important. Not everything can be this organized, structured. Well, we we, we heard a story it. about that. I don't remember who it was, but they were talking about they were you know helping train Kyrie. They were working on pick and rolls, and they were like, hey, when you come off the pick and roll, I want you to do this. And Kyrie was like, I would never do that in that I would do this to this to this. And it, it mainly because they're playing defense on Kyrie, and, <laughs> and you can't. You can't, you so can't. you're not keeping up with them, so it becomes awkward. Yeah. That's what's hilarious about people guarding a Kyrie. Elite level. With, I don't care if you have sticks. Mm-hmm. You have a team of interns who it's, are not <laughs> athletic, who cannot move. Who it's cannot play stick. defense, and so he's still going to be able to do whatever he wants yeah. against you, and it's still not going to be real because they're not. And that's why players get frustrated sometimes in those environments. Yeah, because I can't really do my real actions here because you're not keeping up with me. Yeah, it, it's really like when I played college, I was became a college all American. 
the hardest games was when I went back and played against my against, high school team. Against, like, bad people. Because yeah. I'm running into people. I'm yeah. like, wait, you that's shouldn't what, even be there. That's why I always say men's league is, like, the hardest basketball ever because there are people where they should not be. Yeah, they're guarding you. Like, they're not even keeping up with you. So you have to play the game so easy. Like, awkwardly, yeah. That it's just not keep even it natural anymore. Yeah, yeah, keep it simple and you'll and you'll have it figured out. But, yeah, I could just dribble all the way to the basket, not ever changing direction against yeah. this competition. And you're not used to it. And when I yeah. do this, you should have some kind of reaction. Yeah. But you have people going, running in the opposite ways. Yeah. When we were training at an event, we had a trainer join us, and we were oh. playing pickup, trying to show the he kids kept, what to kept do. He kept posting up. And he kept running in front of driving lanes. And so yeah. when you play with bad people, it's harder too. Mm -hmm. When you play with better players, it's easier to play basketball. Yeah. When you play against better players, why do sometimes you play up towards your competition? Well, because it's sometimes easier to play against people yeah. who do things normally. It can be really awkward playing against bad competition. And so I think that's another whole factor, a whole different episode to go yeah. deeper into that. But in terms of you need to be able to play at times with experimentation in mind yeah. where I'm going to try to really work on this part of my game. I'm going to use the game in, in my mind as times to try things and experiment. Yeah. And then you take that back to your training and you work on the things that you struggled with. Yeah. So there should be a back and forth between experimenting in your play, which you can only do in a pickup like environment mm -hmm. and then go back into your training and it needs to be a proper balance there. Yeah. So one, one thing I would like to say with, with this episode, I am going to do a future episode where I'm going to ask Micah questions that you guys have. So if there are any specific questions that you would really like to know and pick Micah's brain that I can ask for you, I would love if you guys drop those down in the comments. But for the rest of that, I'll leave it up to Micah to wrap this up. I'll just wrap it up. Thanks for joining us for another Dream Loudly episode. We will keep these coming to you every single week. Our objective is Wednesday. So stay up for next Wednesday as long as we don't get interrupted with travel. Bryce mm -hmm. selfishly went on the road with an NBA player for a couple weeks, and so we had to put a, a slight delay on this one. I apologize. So, so we'll try to avoid those and get a little bit of a head. But ask those questions so we can stay on top of this, and we will see you next week with another episode of Dream Loudly.